Hey guys, it's Biggs. Welcome back. Now today, we're going to be dealing with a subject today of something that's been near and dear to me for a while, something I've never actually gotten around to dealing with, other than the fact that I started that one little video series with the two parts about regarding isopods, about can we do it better. And what I meant by that is, can we be doing it better in regards to the way that they should be kept? Granted, most of us can keep these things easily enough in like little shoe boxes, little Sterilite or Rubbermaid shoe boxes, and they'll replicate fine in captivity without any issue. And I'm not arguing that doesn't work, but I think we can still do it better. And I think we can do it far more naturally. <laughs> It's, it's, it's absolutely sweltering today. It's about 45 degrees or something insane here. And that's just not something we don't deal with at all. And I'm covered head to toe because I'm out in the woods and I know there's gonna be bugs, which don't bother me. And I know that I'm gonna be dealing and coming in contact with poison ivy, which is like my nemesis. I'm gonna get, even though I'm wearing long pants, and long shirt, I'm still gonna get poison ivy for sure. But we've got a purpose today. Now isopods, as you guys know, they are detrivores. Detrivores, and in every square foot around me, I guarantee you there's gonna be isopods. Whether you'll see it or not, and not just isopods, but all sorts of other microfauna. And these things are all things that break down everything. Now the one thing that I've talked about before in regards to setting up these enclosures for isopods and trying to do it better, is that we're trying to get that understanding of how a natural system works. And most importantly, a natural system in regards to the soil stratification. So the soil is gonna basically, everything's gonna be layered on top as leaves fall in the winter time when all these plants around me and all, the, all these plants die and fall down. All these things are gonna to have to get broken down by nature. I see you jerk plant, jerk plant, jerk plant. They're all around me and I don't like them. So today I've come to my friend's farm and they have about 20 plus acres. And most of that is still pristine woods. And the forest is fresh, the forest is natural, and that gives us a per perfect opportunity to look for things and understanding the soil stratification so we can do our isopods better. So let's get take a look at it. Now the natural ecology of the forest floor is very, very complex. But the system, the natural system, is designed to basically break everything down and return it to nature. As you can see here, this was a log at one point in time, or a tree that had fallen down many, many years ago. It's still pretty firm, but uh, it's been replaced. And there's different types of mosses. Now, if you look at the mosses on the surface, most of them look like they've been burnt off. That's because we're sitting in kind of a clearing here and it's exposed to direct sunlight. So any of the mosses that are exposed to direct sunlight look like they've been burnt off a little bit because we've had this exceptional heat wave that's come through as of late. But if you look anywhere else, there's some mosses in there. These are natural things that reproduce, unlike say more modern plants, which are reproduced by flowers and seeds, mosses, ferns, they reproduce by spores. They do not produce any flowers. They just really produce by spores. And you can see all the ground, all the byproduct of the leaves, animal wastes, anything is being reclaimed by nature. Even if you look at the surface of this rock, you wouldn't think that's much activity happening. But these mosses and lichens, these things are all alive and they are doing their part. And although we may not be able to see it at the scale in regards to the timeline, but these things are actually taking away from the rock itself, minerals from the rock itself, and slowly bringing it back to nature. So when we think about keeping isopods, we layer them using a nice organic substrate. Well, that's understandable because we can see, you know, the, the organic levels here within this, this forest floor. And then we add humus and we add decaying leaves and rotting wood and those type of products. And those type of products all create back to the environment. Now the area I'm walking in right now, the entire ground is spongy. Each step I sink down about three, four inches. This is ultimately gonna be what would have been a bog a few months ago before the big heavy, uh, the, the long extended dry period. Because you can see all the different mosses that have been burnt off. They would be requiring 
in almost a constant humidity. And after a big heavy rain, this will come back. Now here's a perfect example. We've got some different types of ferns growing here, but this was originally the stump of a tree. You can see the trees falling down, the trees being reclaimed by mosses, and all the microbial fauna that's all within it, different types of lichens and so forth, and they are breaking down that product, giving it back to the forest floor. By breaking it down, you get all the products, all the carbon and so forth, and all the elements and the ingredients left over from the tree itself. You see there's different animals have been here. All their waste products will be broken down as well. And every one of these things, all the raw elements are given back to nature. Now it has come up a question, Biggs, why do you got your snake hook? Well, where I live, there's really no issues. There's no threats of any snakes here whatsoever. Where I live, we have uh, three snake species, two of which are garter snakes, and one being the little red belly snake, which is basically a glorified worm for size. So there's never any issue. However, I use a snake hook more as, as a concern for anybody that might live in an area where there are animals that could potentially harm you. So a snake hook is a real valuable tool, especially if you live in one of those areas, flipping over a dead tree tree or something like that just with your hands put yourself in harm's way something like this makes it makes it a lot safer for you so be very cautious when you're out in the woods the bigs doesn't want anybody to get hurt doing this when we break apart one of these broken down logs we can see that it's basically returned it's all crumbly they're returning it back to nature there's very very little of the original product left and if it wasn't laying on the ground and you still saw the telltale signs that it was a tree you probably wouldn't know what it was. And that's one way that nature brings it back. So when we talk about for isopods, we talk about using slabs of bark and stuff like that. We add it as basically as a surface for them to go on, but it actually serves another purpose because these are things that they actually break down. Rotting wood. Now like a piece like this, it doesn't feel like a sponge I'm holding, but that sort of thing I'm gonna take back because I'll soak that in water overnight and that'll bring out any sort of parasites or problems or centipedes or dangerous things that I do not want to introduce to one of my colonies. But all that natural living microfauna like the bacteria and so forth will still be present. And I can add that into an isopod of vivarium and that'll be a wonderful natural food source. So along those thinkings of the, the isopod containers that we've been talking about is when we say you want to add leaf litter, well, obviously leaf litter makes sense. It's prevalent on a forest floor and it's not just leaf litter, it's all that matter. It's the animal droppings, dead insects, so forth, all those products. When we talk about using wood products, this is ideal. This piece is absolutely ideal. You can see the bark is just falling off of it. You know, the only problem being with something like this is you do run the risk of introducing pathogens that you may not want to your environments. But to an isopod, say as a, an armadillidium species that is basically a true detrivore and it breaks down more plant matter, this is absolutely a haven for them. So this type of a product, if we can get this home, maybe clean this up a little bit. And if you were genuinely concerned about introducing things, you could bake this in the oven at a low temperature for a period of time and that would kill off any sort of pathogens that may be within it or you could soak it underwater. Now if something like this I'll probably have to find a big Rubbermaid tub, put a bunch of rocks on top of it and let it submerge overnight for a bit but this is all that rotting wood is absolutely ideal. This is just product that is just ideal for them. It's a great component in your substrates for your isopods. So we've harvested a few things to take back with us came across that rotting tree, so we're going to take back that stump that we talked about. We found some nice little pieces of rotting wood. These are things that we're going to break down and add to our, uh, our substrate. Nice pieces of rotting wood. You can see the lichens and different types of fine mosses on it. And then some of the different mosses we found, some of them are just fascinating. You know, is this a moss or is this a fern? Not really certain, you know. So, lots of fabulous stuff, ideal for our isopods and done naturally. So it's really, get out in nature, take a closer look. There's a rotten tree, you know, and when we pick apart that rotten tree, it is just teeming with life. Being broken down and reclaimed. And isopods are a large part of that. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. I sure enjoyed doing it for you. 
Uh, I didn't talk about anything too much in depth. Bugs are horrible. I'm completely soaked in sweat because of the temperature. I feel like I live underwater. But uh, I think we've collected enough stuff. Always be sustainable. Take a little bit, you know, use what you can, but don't overuse it and stuff and let nature replenish itself. And that product will always be available for you down the road. So I think now we got to go home and we have to set up something. So Biggs can't just do everything. Hey, Biggs, why don't you do? Practice what you preach. That's exactly what we're going to do. So next step, next video, we're going to be talking about setting up a naturalistic styled vivarium for isopods. And not just any isopod. We're going to go with absolutely the cream of the crop, one of the most desirable isopods, and we're going to risk it in a natural setting. Stay tuned. So as always, my friends, thank you kindly for watching. We'll see you soon. Take care.